Everybody. on everybody if you haven't yet please hit that like button that helps us uh that helps other people find the stream and i hope you guys are having a solid thursday um if you have any questions for me you can throw those in the chat and i will get to them today everybody we are going over some chord inversions um so i hope i hope you're excited about that because chord inversions are going to open up the neck for you Com- almost completely. They're, they're going to show you where everything is. Um, and that's why I love, like, that's why I don't, I don't think of things in ways of scales. Um, I try to figure out the key of the song. So if you can tell me the key of the song, I'm golden. But um, the, the only reason that that works is because I know my chord inversions. I know where the different shapes of the chord are up and down the neck. And if you've, if you've watched any of these before, you know that that's, that that's what I tell everybody. I tell everybody that chord inversions, chord inversions, chord inversions, because that's, that's what it is. That's what makes this happen. Because all you're ever doing when you're soloing is going between different chord inversions. All you're ever doing when you're soloing is tracing chord patterns. And that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, we'll wait until a, maybe, maybe a few more people show up before we start getting into the thick of it. But if you guys have any questions or concerns, comments, throw those in the chat. Um, if you haven't yet, please hit the like button. That helps out a lot. That really, uh, it, it helps other people find the, the stream and the lessons. Uh, And we're going to start with uh, some pretty simple, some pretty simple ideas. We're going to work between, we're going to work on going between like E and A. We'll work on E and A up and down the neck. Where's the big gig on Saturday? We're playing this thing called Riverfront Nights. Tennessee's Dead is the, the other Grateful Dead tribute that I'm in. And we're doing a thing called Riverfront Nights here in Chattanooga. And we're going to be down um, we're going to be down by the river. We're going to be like down on the water, which is going to be awesome. We're doing the, they decided to, uh, to spin it as like a tribute to Jerry, um, which we didn't plan for. We're just going to play grateful dead tunes. We didn't know that they were going to try to shoehorn us into doing like a celebration of Jerry. Luckily, most of the stuff we're doing could also be like Jerry band stuff, but yeah, that was a little weird to like wake up to, uh, and, and another thing, too, is there's another Tennessee dead. There's, so we're Tennessee's dead, and we were first. We started in 2016, but then some old dudes up in Nashville decided they wanted to rip our name off. So they are now Tennessee dead. They took the apostrophe S off of it, 
um, but they're Tennessee dead. And when I asked them to change their name a few years ago, I got told no because they had already copyrighted a sticker with their name on it. So they decided to just steal our name. Um, and there was a lot of confusion because a, uh, uh, an article was written about us, written about us for this show. Um, and it was, uh, it was about the other band, about the Nashville band. Which, uh, which is like, what the fuck? Do a little bit of research. But anyways. All right, chord inversions. So the idea behind chord inversions are, so you've got, you've got different, different ways to play the same chords up and down the neck. So you've, we'll start with an E. Um, so everybody knows that solid E chord, that first E chord. But you've also got an E chord here. And this is what we call kind of like the C shape, C shaped chords, because it's like if you're doing a regular C. So all of your chord shapes are down here in first position, right? See, it does make no sense without the apostrophe. That's what I'm saying. So like, so Tennessee's dead. It's possessive. We are the, we are the grateful dead thing of Tennessee. We are Tennessee's dead, but they're just Tennessee dead because it's ripping off Tennessee Jed and ripping us off. It's bullshit. Uh, but anyways, all right. So you've got an E here. And then so all of your different chord shapes are here. So you've got the E shape. You've got the C shape or just C shape, right? You've got D shape, which, in, which ends up being basically a C shape chord. But you've got that shape. You've got this shape. You've got this shape. Um, and then you've got this kind of shape where it's, sorry, this finger's not in at all. You've got like F shape, which is basically your E shape. Um, so that's basically your shapes right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to work on E, E and A. So you've got an E here, you've got an A there, right? So E, A, but then your next E is right here, right? Doing that C shape. So what you'll do is you'll take that, take your middle finger, put it on the B string, on the fifth fret and then make that make that C shape. So your pinky is going on the seventh fret. Your ring finger is going on the sixth fret on the D string. So A, D, and then on the you're gonna skip the G string because you're, you're barring with this finger. You're barring barring those there. So right? So there's that E. And then you've got an A here. Right? So you've got this this technically like E-shaped bar chord A right there. So you've got... Right? And there, there are two, two chord inversions right there. So one, two, one, two. Right? And then so now, now there's another E right here, which gives you this kind of shape that Bob used to do all the time. Jerry used to do it too, but it's, it's more of a Bob kind of, kind of uh, chording. So... So you've got your, so you're basically, so you've got that, that E right here, but you're just using that root. So you can take those away and then right there, you've got that E root. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your pinky and you're going to put it on that G string on the ninth fret. And then you've got a really nice open E chord. Right? But then from there, what you're going to do is you're going to move that up. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your, your pointer finger and you're going to move that up a fret. You're going to move that up a half step. So you're basically just... So you move this up a half step, you move the other one up a whole step, and then you move your pinky up a whole step. So, And then that's your A there, right? So you've got... E A, E A, E A, and that's a different kind of A, but it still falls in there and it still works. So you could even do like if uh, if you were gonna do kind of like a uh, uh, yeah, that Bob E chord is great. It's just a really nice open E, and so like if you're if you're jamming or something like that, and you want to hit a really big open E, you can hit this one or that one and this one has a little bit more of like a harmonic flair to it that I really enjoy um, and then you've got this and then if you move that up another whole step 
that's like the B. So if you were going to do something like, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, what, I shall be released. If you're going to do something like that, so it'd be like, they say everything can be replaced. Yet every distance is not near. But I remember every face of every man who's put me here. So if you're going to do that same thing down here, it'd be that same thing. So you just do an E, an A, and a B, right? So they say everything can be replaced. Oh, they're doing F sharp minors and stuff there. Um, so... Whatever, though. You get you get what I'm saying, that there are different ways to do this up and down the neck. So we've got the E here, A there, and then you've got this next E here, which is that A shape. The... But you'd be doing it like that, where you're barring here on the 7th fret, and then doing that either with your pinky or that, that finger there on the ninth fret. So there's an E there. So you've got E here, E here, E here, E here. And then you're gonna do you're gonna do this next one, which is up here, and that's just starting this one over. Because it's your 12th fret, your 12th fret, everything starts over. It's just like getting to the nut again, right? So that's basically zero. Fret zero. And then another E, another A. So you've got E A, E A, E A, and then E A. So this A here is a C-shaped. C-shaped A. So you've got that same from here. But it's up here now. So. And you see how you're just going from an E and then you're throwing on that A? You see how easy that is? So you've got E here, E here, E here, E here, E here. So those are your main ones, right? And that works for every chord up and down the neck. So do you see how do you see how this is going to open everything up for you? It's going to give you everything you need to know. Okay? So guys, if you haven't yet, please like the stream that helps other people find it while we're doing it. Um so it's going to give you everything you need. So you've got this So E to A and then E to A E to A So like that's it's super simple but what it does is it shows you where everything is because remember soloing is just tracing these different chord patterns right so you can see here if I'm at this E so let's just uh So I've got an E and A loop going So if we start down here I've done there is gone between the different shapes of E. That's it. Because I know one's here and I know one's here, right? So what I'm going to do is. So I've just been tracing this one. Back to the other one. All right, so now I'm going to start working my way up to that next E, which is here and here, right? Now 
now I'm up here. See, I've worked my way from those. It's just, it's so simple once you know where all these are. Things don't have to be as complicated as you want to make them. Things can be as easy as you'd like them to be, okay? Because, again, all we're doing is tracing, tracing these chords, guys. And now I'm already back up to the next one, using sixths. And that was a huge thing that Jerry liked to do. Um, so that's just an E and an A. Okay, so now I'm gonna work my way up and down. I'm gonna show you each one. So this is that original E, first E, first position. Now we're gonna move up to that second one. See, we've worked our way up and back down. We're gonna work up to this third one. And, and again, that one's a little bit easier because we've already got that root laid out. So you're basically using, you're basically using the same root of E right here for the next three. So you've got it here on that second one, you've got it here for that third one, and then for that fourth one, it's all within that same area using that same E root. Okay, using that one here. A string seventh fret so as long as you know where that is you can get to these three those three E chords right and then you know your next one is just the start over so does that mean they are different kinds of scales I say ignore scales that's but that's me if it helps you to think of it in scales that's fine, but for me, it's much easier to think about just chord shapes and chord tones. It's, it's so much easier. I don't have to fucking think about it because you're already playing in pentatonic and mixolydian if you're, if you're doing this, you know? So I say, don't worry about that. Christopher Mayer, you are right. Less is, less is sometimes more. Most of the time, less is more. It's all about, it's all about uh, especially when you're wanting to especially when you're wanting to like lead in a little bit or if you're wanting to like leave space because a lot of the times it's about the notes you don't play. It's about the space you leave. That's real music is the, the spaces in between. You know what I mean? So, so sometimes it's better. It's better, less is more. But, and I don't know if he was trying to make a dig at me or what, but I, I think that playing less is more sometimes, especially when you're an expressive player like, like I am, like Jerry was. If you're an expressive player, then less is more a lot of the time. What's going on, David Lincoln? Um, so if we want to if we want to change it up now, if we want to do if we want to do some different chords, what we can do now is we, we can do an A to a D, right? So we got the E's down. So E E E E E, right? So now if we're gonna go A, so it'd be A, so A A A. <laughs> There's so many. It's just there's there's so many options. You've got an A here, right? Got an A here. 
You've got an A here, you've got an A here, and you've got an A here. So, it's that same kind of idea though, they just start in a different place. Uh... Oh, and Christopher brings up another good point. Uh, when you're building up, don't bring out your best riffs. Always start out, like, and don't come out the gate ripping the dick off of it. It's always better to start simple and build your way up. And sometimes start low and build your way up, or start higher, simpler, work your way down, get more technical as you work your way back up, and really let, let it, let it out. Um, good, good shit, Christopher. Um, fire up the milkman. The milkman is fired up. That's what you're listening to. Um... So you've got an A here, A here, A here, that's C-shaped A. But again, remember, once you get to this C-shaped A, you're going to be using the same root for the next ones. So you've got A here, and you've got A here, that same, that bobby-shaped chord, but you're just up here, so it's a little bit more scrunched up. And then this A. And then the relative, like we were doing E to A, this one's going to be A to D. Right? Because that's like the next relative relative chord. So if we were going to do... We got that there. So... See what I'm doing there? If you can see, I'm literally just tracing the A chord and the D chord. So you've got the A here and you've got the D here, right? So literally, it's just. So many of us, and especially, and, and I'm not, and I'm guilty of this too. Like I make it so much harder on myself. I remember that when I first started playing, like soloing was just so far outside of my realm of like, of what I could think to do. Uh, but then through psychedelics and just like watching other people and watching Jerry and like watching Trey, watching Frank Zappa, watching like and uh, like uh, um, watching Adrian Ballou with Talking Heads and King Crimson, like all they're doing is you're just tracing un unless you move into like diminished stuff, but then you're just tracing diminished chords. You know what I mean? Like for every everything that you're trying to do, you are just tracing that version of that chord. Um, so. If it, if it helps you to think about it in terms of scales or modes, if you've already gone that far, think about it like that. But if not, this is the way to do it. This is the easiest way that I've found to do it. And sometimes easy isn't best, you know, because I know that I'm stunted in some other areas. I know I'm not the best guitar player. I'm not out there to be. Um, I just watched the Tennessee Deadvid, very basic biatch cover band, in my opinion, the apostrophe band is where it's at. That's right, Goodwill. That's what I'm saying. Um, so... That A and that D, so you've got an A and a D there, you've got an A and a D here, right? So, bum, bum, and then you've got this A, bum, bum, and that D, so, bum, bum, then you've got, uh, bum, bum, and then bum, bum, right there. So if you've got this thing going again. And so if you know you're down here doing this A, you know that this A can start up here. Right, so if you wanted to come out the gate a little bit higher in the register, you just move up to this A. Because you've also got another A right here, because it all starts back over at that 12th fret. So you've got an A here that's the same as this A. And up here is that C-shaped A, if you can even get it, but like, it's, it's usually mostly for like, single notes up here, but it's up here too. So we'll start from this one to and move up to this one, okay? Now 
now we're up to this other one. All right, so let's go from this one to this one, okay? You see how fast I got there? You see how easy that is? So once you know where it is, so you've got an A here and an A here, it's not that hard to get from one to the other just using notes and using the whole, whole half method. Because there's, there's, there's a pattern to it. You know, it's not, there's no, there's no real guesswork, guys. It's all there. It's all just laid out in front of you. I know that, that making it, making it make sense takes time, but the chord inversions are the fastest way there. So if you take the time and learn all of these different chord inversions, it is going to be so easy. Sorry, I got a little bit of thing from my, my cleaning cloth on my string here. Um, when you take the time and learn that, it's just going to make it. Make it super easy. Um, it says for for mixing. S Hold on. So Andrew in Wonderland. I'm trying. Let, let me. I'm gonna catch up to you guys real quick. So uh, Andrew in Wonderland says, "Hey man, I've been trying to figure out where to solo for Road Jimmy. Do you understand how that song works for lead?" Yeah. So Road Jimmy's a weird one. So that song changes tempo, or the song changes time like three times within the verse. So it's weird. You're just in A dominant. It's, it's in A, uh, but you do want to change with the chords. So I think um, go practice to uh, Jeff Williams. Shout out Jeff Williams. Uh, practice to Jeff Williams' Row Jimmy track so you can see where the chord changes happen. And then from there, so it, I, it starts on an A. The Julie catch a rabbit by his head. Yeah, by his head. Hold on, no, I'm not doing that right. But anyways, it's a, it's a little bit easier to play in A, and especially if you've got those chords going to show you, so I know that it'll start on it. So you'll just, you'll hang out in A, and then like, it just... The, the important thing is to hit the chords, A, G, B, minor, D. Well, so it's, it's Julie catch a rabbit by his head. Come back, step and like to walk on And like, I'm not too sure about the, the time signature changes because up until a few years ago, I just played it straight through on four, but that's not how it is. Um, thank you, Christopher. Uh, learning C-shaped bar chords take time. It does take time because you've got to make your hand because you're not used to making that C-shape with your pinky. You're not used to doing that, right? It's a little, it's a little awkward. It's a little, you're not, it feels like you're not supposed to do that. But once you learn it, it's, it's locked in, baby. And like, if you'll notice, like Bob and Jerry love to use those chords. And if you'll notice a lot of the stuff of like a lot of like photos of Jerry and stuff, he's very pinky forward up because that's like what a lot of these these chords just do that. You know, you have to have that pinky out, you know, like you're drinking a cup of tea. Pinky out, everybody. Um, it would be interesting to hear you improvise what you do on an acoustic. I just picked up an electric guitar and I'm finding the chord inversions much easier on electric. Absolutely. So usually when you're playing, when you're playing an acoustic, you kind of want to just chill in first position and second position. You know what I mean? Because like once you start getting farther up the neck, you know, your, your, your action gets a little bit higher. It's a little bit harder to do. It's one of those things where it's almost better to just like use that for like leading uh, instead of like trying to play your notes up here. But, but if you've got like a cutaway or something and your action's good enough, it should be it should be fine. You should be able to do the same thing, and it might even be better for you to practice on an acoustic because then you'll actually like really learn to like push into those chords. Because um, everybody knows that cording on an electric is so much easier than cording on an acoustic, just because like the the string the string tension and um, the thickness of the neck and all that jazz, all that jizz. You know what I'm saying? Um, but 
So if we're if we're going back again, now you we've done E's. So E, 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 E. Sorry, I forgot that one. E. Got those. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading a comment. That's my bad. Um, so I'm building a melody while soloing. Okay, so that, that comes with, with figuring out how melodic you want to be. So like, and I think listening to a lot of like, uh, a lot of like maybe even like Motown or like some, some funk or something with like really emotional leads. So if you've got, um, and it's all about finding that vocal line. So you've got, so if we're going to do old, old faithful is like a sugary. So we've got See if that lines up right. That's fine. Okay, so so if we're going by chord inversions, so you've got it B. So you've got this B right here. You've got this B right here, right? So we're gonna go between those. And just try to find the vocal melody. So it'd be like, when they come to take you down, when they bring the wagon around, when they come to call on you, drag your poor body down. And you know, with stuff like that, it doesn't have to match up. It doesn't have to match up note for note. But as long as you've got that idea of what you want that lead line to sound like, if you think about like the melodic tone of it and things like that, it doesn't matter if the notes specifically match up to what it would actually be. Does that make sense? So it'd be like... See, all I'm doing, again, is like I'm just tracing this B chord. You've got this B chord right here. And you've got this, this C-shaped B right here. So you see what I'm doing there is you've got this B here, you've got a B here and a B here. And using the whole whole half method, it's so easy to get between them. At that point, it just becomes expressiveness. It becomes like, because once you, once you get that down, then the playground is open. Then you just figure out to you what sounds right to you, right? So at that point, I, I know where I'm at. So I know that this B right here, I know this B right here, and I know this B right here. And I know because of the whole whole half method, like where my, where my kind of like, where my area is, you know, like I know how to stay within the bounds. I know how to color within the lines on these. Um, because again, I know that right here. So bum, 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 bum. Now I'm in that other one. Bum, 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 bum. Now I'm in this one, right? So at that point it just becomes, 
okay, well, how do I want to play in the sandbox? Like, how expressive do I want to be in the sandbox? Because with, with these, like... You can have a lot of fun with like bins and and just sustain notes because we all know that Jerry loved to do that. He loved to do those long bins that where you could just man um let's see here. Sugar, she, let's see. Carter says, Can you say something about your early history with soloing? What would you say was the breakthrough songs when you felt you had it? One or two big light bulb moments for you. Okay, so um Let's see here. The the big light bulb moment for me was again is chord inversions, whole whole half method. Because once I realized that I could just work that in, it was everything was open. Everything was open to me. So all I literally all I need to know is what key the song is in, and I'm golden now because I know my chord inversions. I know my whole whole half method. Um. The breakthrough songs, one of them is, of course, uh, Sugary because it's just so simple. The The way it's laid out is so simple. Uh, Sugary, fucking Franklin's Tower. Those are songs that are super easy to solo over. Uh, Fire on the Mountain. Again, another two-chord song that is just so easy to solo over. But you can make it as complicated as you want, you see? So, like, it's really just about, again, how you want to play in the sandbox. Like, what you want to build in that sandbox. You can make it as simple or as uh, technical as you want to. And again, like you can throw in other modes, you can throw in other things like that. I, I can't think about it like that because that, confu- that that makes it too, too much for me and I like to have fun while I'm playing. I like to be able to like let go and just let my, my mind and my fingers do what they want to do. Um, Ian Quitner says, for me it was once I got the inversions down. My boy, you can kind of use pentatonic to link them, yes, but truly once you get to using chords, yeah. Let's see. You forget about pentatonic and start using your ears for intervals to fill in the melody. My man, Ian Quitner, he gets it. Uh, maybe show the major pentatonic diatonic scale box as a starting place for mapping yourself uh, to start a solo. Yeah. So uh, again, that but that falls into that whole whole half method. So so pentatonic, mixolydian, all all that shit, and Dorian, which is basically just minor mixolydian. Um, it's all it's all that same kind of thing where if you know where you're going, if you know where to start, you can figure out where you're going, if that makes sense. Um, I know that I'm explaining this like a fucking dirty hippie, dirty wook, but that's that's all I can do. Um, can you talk about some songs that are more orchestrated, like Music Never Stopped? Do you just memorize some ideas for various sections? Maybe talk about the Chuck Berry ideas like in process. Okay, so with something like... Yeah, Front of the Mountain has been one tryout. Jeff Williams' map over top of the backing track was helpful for me. So, yeah, that's one thing that Jeff Williams does great. He throws up. He throws up where your notes are. He throws up everything that you need to do. And if you want to pay attention to that, do that. For me, it's better to just know where I'm at and then play around like that. Figure out, because, like, if you've got those backing tracks on, you can play them forever. You know, you can really work out where those notes are that work and don't work. And Fire on the Mountain is one of those fun ones, too, because you can stay in B the whole time or you can work in that A for like a little bit of a, a, a change up, you know, a little little shift up in feel. Um, OK, so something like the music never stopped. It only has it only has several areas, like a few areas where you can really rip a solo. And one of them is in A major, I know for sure. And the other one is in E, I believe. Um and other than that, you've just memorized the song. Because uh, there's the, and they kept on dancing. And then that's where he goes into the. That kind of shit. And that's just in A. That's just A. Um, Jeff's diagrams help, but they suck me into the scales again. And I'm, if I'm not, exactly. Ian, that's, that's what I'm talking about. It's better if you need to do that for a little bit, like maybe for a week or two, just so you get like the idea. But really the main goal is to be able to improvise, right, guys? 
and and seeing those seeing those up above and um like really letting yourself fall into those can be a little bit of a trap because uh being an improv player is really relying on your connection with the ether right an improv player what well at least what i do is i try to tap into the thing outside of me that makes me musical i feel like i am a conduit for something for something else for other things to flow through me um and that's not me being like pig-headed or anything. A lot of musicians feel that way because it doesn't come from me. It comes from somewhere else. Um, and I'm just letting it pass through. I'm letting it come through my fingers. So the more uninhibited I can be to let that, to let that channel through, the, the better. Um, so you've got... So what did I have this set up to? I had sugary set up. Um, the, the best thing to do is to just know where you start and where you can go. And just like let your let let your brain fill it in. Like you, you gotta because I know that you guys have listened to this music so much that you kinda know. You kinda know what you're wanting. about expression it's all about emotion i think it was george clinton that told uh the guitarist during maggot brain to play like your mama just died and i love that play like your mama just died <laughs> um let's see uh yo do you reckon sometime you will make a lesson for china cat and touch of gray touch of gray was last week's lesson so that's actually up you can go learn touch of gray right now your prayers have been answered china cat is coming soon um because I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I want to do a China writer, if I want to teach both of them in the same one, or do China Cat Sunflower and then the next week do writer. Um, uh, let's see here. And I, ho I hope, guys, like now now what I can do, since that, that's been about 40 minutes of that for the next maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, however long we're going to do this, um, I'll field some questions. If you have questions about me, the channel, whatever, um, Let's see here. Last time I was here, spoke about the deadbolt from Fred considering getting it. I don't know what attachments to have on it, etc. Um, you know, I say if you want to do the pickups, if you want to get the DiMarzio Super 2s, I would say go ahead and just order them from DiMarzio yourself. They're going to be a little bit cheaper. Um, they'll be 70 bucks a piece if you get them from DiMarzio, whereas like Fred's going to charge you, first of all, for them and to get to put them in. Now, I love Freddy, and I love Fred, uh, but, I mean, you don't really need to pay him to, to get the pickups. The stock ones that come in it are fine if you can wait a little bit. Um, I would suggest getting the brass nut, but, again, if you don't, if, if don't want to buy the one on the site, you can definitely just order one off of Amazon or something. Um, they come stock great, and, I mean, like, all the other pickups and upgrades and shit, like, they're, you know, you can, you can live without them. The, the actual just full stock instrument is fine. It's great actually um and then just you know all the extra stuff is just extra like the i love the brass plate like i would i would pick one of these up from freddy like i would get the brass plate installed i would get the other brass plate installed uh these knobs i got off of amazon for cheap uh just to give it a little bit more color and i love the olympic bridge the olympic stop tail piece i love that i, I like it a lot more than just like a regular stop bar um the USA electric rework for $200. I didn't get the, the, the rewire. I didn't, it, it worked perfectly for me. So that's just a way for, for Freddie to like, get some, get some, get some sweetness on top, you know, like I'm sure it will, it'll sound better for sure. If he, if he US rewires it, of course, 
it's going to sound a little bit better. And it also gives him time to put some hands on it. You know, it's always better if it gets hands put on it before it gets sent to you. Um, let's see. Ian says your first workshop on lead was the breakthrough moment for me. Once I screwed with the whole, whole half a bit and linking versions inversions, it came easier to improvise. Exactly. That's all it takes. It just takes time. That's how you make a diamond. You take a lump of coal and it just takes time and pressure. Just like you, you diamond in the rough. That's all it takes is time and pressure. Guys, if you haven't yet, please hit that like button. That helps us out a lot. Uh, helps other people find it. Um, I thought I saw some kind of sticker on the Fred on one of the lives the other day. Oh, I've got this. Talking about this guy. My little uh, Mayota bear. That's from a company in town called Cheese Frog. They, made, they make that sticker. Um, and, and I'm not a huge fan. Oh, Ian, thank you so much, man. That, that means a lot. I appreciate that. Um, now, the, the stickers that came on the Fred that came on here, I took off immediately. I took those off as soon as I, I finished edit or as soon as I finished shooting the, the unboxing video where it was broken, took them off immediately. Cause I'm not, I'm not a huge sticker on the guitar guy. That's why this sticker is on the back panel, the plastic back panel. Cause I don't want stickers on the actual instrument. Um, cause I know Jerry loved to have stickers. I know he liked stickers before he started getting the inlays done, but to me, stickers on the front of guitars is just a little bit, it, to me, it seems a little disrespectful to the actual instrument to like be putting stickers on beautiful wood. Um, but that's just me. That's that's how I've always felt. Um, ugh. So I took the stickers off because, again, I didn't even want when when I first thought about getting one of these guitars, I never wanted the yellow one because I didn't want to be I didn't want to be all up on Jerry's dick. You know, I didn't want to be like, oh, I'm going to have my Jerry guitar and it's going to look just like Jerry's wolf. I originally wanted the brown wolf or the scarlet wolf. Um, uh, wanted the brown wolf or the scarlet wolf, and uh, he was like, uh, "No." <laughs> he was like, "I've got this. I've got this yellow one sitting in the office that I'll throw pickups in and send to you." And I was like, "Sounds great. Not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth, you know." Can I explain the whole whole half method? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Swowsk. I man. No problem. I love you guys. This this means the world to me that you guys actually want to hear me talk about it because I'm not book learned at all. Like I can't read music. If someone's like play this scale, I'm just going to play how I play, you know. So I appreciate you guys being patient with me because I, I'm literally just figuring out what I think about it because before I've had this channel, I've never had to externalize and explain to people how I play. So this has really upped my game as like you know, a teacher, again, not really a teacher, I'm your friend. Um, so we learn as much from, like, I learn as much from you guys as you do from me, I'm sure. Um, let's see. My favorite lessons of your, David says, my favorite lessons of yours are Mix Cali and Shakedown. Those are really great. Uh, the editing cracks me up. Keep up the great work. Your soloing is really solid across. Thank you, man. Uh, there was a time, uh, Fishy Fish says, there was a time when someone thought my guitar was theirs, and the only way I convinced them was by showing them the sticker on the back. Boom! Good man. Always have an identifying mark on your shit. Always mark all your shit with something that you know is yours and can't be refuted all the time. Um, <laughs> Mighty Vapor 82 says, hello, how does Jerry make that really fast sound going up and Going up and down, you hear it on songs like Morning Dew. It goes like... Yeah. Uh, would you say that kind of, uh, kind of thinking... Would you say that kind of thinking leads to individuality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just don't get the pea lady in it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Homer. That means a lot, man. When he moves his pick so fast, so you've got, you've got, you've got ones like even if he's doing like, like sugary, he'll when it when the when the jam is getting up. I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, or you're talking about the other really fast picking that he does. But he's got this thing where he'll do. Uh, so we're starting on a B. You've got a B right here. So B. That kind of thing. Yeah, so what he's doing is he's just 
He's just trill picking. He's just trill picking. So what that is, is you've got... You're really just finding your chords there. So you've got a B right here. So you got a B, and then I'm just going down to an A before I run up to that E. So you've got an E right here, that C-shaped E chord or D-shaped E chord, whatever you want to do. So that's, and that's, and that's how he does it, is he'll get up here. He'll get up here and do it. And if you watch, if you watch videos of anybody who does Jerry stuff or Jerry himself, that's how he's doing it. He's getting up here. Because when you've got this much purchase on your guitar, and he's also, you, sometimes you'll grip right here to like give yourself something to like go off of, because if you're down here, it won't hit as well. So if I move up here. And if you're up past your pickups, if you're up past your pickups, it kind of deadens it a little bit. So it's not getting all those sharp pick hits because since you're not on your pickups, it's just really just picking up that trill of the string sound. Jesse Beecham, what's up? Um, and and that's, that's what that is. That's, that's all that is. And you can do that for any song. And Jerry used to do it a lot, especially it really helps like build things up. If you've gotten to a really big point and your solo really isn't kind of like breaking through at all, you can just hit those. And then I'll do that on, on sugary. I'll do. And then when I'm done. Yeah, and okay, so the whole whole half, uh, who is it that asked? Pass the milk. So the whole whole half, uh, it basically just, so think about it. So whole step, whole step, half step. That's what whole whole half means. So if you're doing an E, sorry, I'll bring back this. So you're doing an E, so we're starting on, on that A string on that second fret. So whole step, whole step, half. Now we're on an E root. Now you're in that next E chord, right? So you've got an E here, got an E here, whole, whole, half. And that's what you use, that, that idea for every string. So whole, whole, half, and then half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half. Oh, shit. Whole. Sorry, I got a little confused there. And after practicing a little bit, after practicing a little bit, you'll be able to hear, you'll be able to hear where your whole steps and your half steps go because you'll be like, ah, that doesn't really quite work. Um, Jerry's three slides from top of guitar to bottom. Yeah, that'll happen. Um, any, any other burning questions? What if you're minor though? So if you're doing E minor, well, I mean, it's that same, it's that same kind of idea. So if you're doing minors, so you've got a minor here, minor here, minor here, minor there, that E minor, it's that same, it's that same idea. So, so. So if you're doing E minor, it's basically G major, right? So so you would be you would basically be playing in G major if you're doing an E minor. So uh, 
I, I don't know if that, that completely computes to you yet, but there's, there's a way to look at it to where you really don't ever have to change what you're doing. <laughs> and that's just the cheat sheet that I've found. Um, cause if you've got an E minor here, sorry, I'll go in close again. If you've got an E minor here, your G is just right there. So if you've, let me get rid of that. So if we're going to do like an E minor to, so like an E minor to D kind of thing, like. Sorry, that's, that was dog shit. All right. So that's just an E minor and a D. But what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to play in G. just G and that's so it's the relative major and you can basically just stay in that and then live your life live your best life baby girl you know what I'm saying um let's see hey Davey uh remind them for a whole half uh if you have a second could you explain the point of Jerry's obel setup is it just so there's always a loud sound coming from the pickups for his pedals no so um David if you want to go I, I explain the obel in the the hubbub video so there's a hubbub and obel explanation video that's up if you want to go check that out that's really in depth but basically what it is is you're sending out a mono 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 signal and a stereo signal they're going into the hubbub which is a loop basically just an effects loop so when you have the onboard effects loop on you've got that stereo signal so it's basically sending a signal through all of your pedals and then your pedals are going back on itself and then to the amp. So what it does is the onboard effects loop basically just pastes your um, your effect on top of your tone. So your tone isn't running through the pedals getting muddier, right? It keeps your tone nice and true, okay? And it also allows you to not lose any intensity of the effect as you roll the volume up and down. And that's another huge... Like, I think everybody should have an O-Bell on their, on their guitar, no matter what they're playing. An onboard effects loop just allows your, it cleans your tone up massively. It, it keeps, keeps everything the way it's supposed to do. Um, your, your tone still shines through even your effects, uh, which, is, which is great. Because you, your effects usually, if you're just going straight into your effects, into your amp, you're losing signal. First of all, your signal, unless you have buffers, unless you have some signal buffers, you're going to be losing signal pushing it through, and your pedals will color your tone. They'll, they'll change the way your natural tone sounds. Um, so an onboard effects loop is a great way to deal with that. Um, let's see. Do I ever use chord tone scale sequencing or patterns for long runs or connecting runs? I feel like Jerry, I heard Jerry use them. Uh, more than likely, Jerry was a lot more proficient in actual scales and modes than I am because I just go by ear and I use the whole whole half method and chord inversions. Um, have I done a Deep Ellen Blues lesson? No, not yet, uh, but it will be coming. Whole whole half out of the relative then. Yes. You're welcome for the solo workshops, Kelly. Kelly and Roy. Uh, I've only been playing guitar for about five months, says Mighty Vapor 82 I'm still a beginner. Jerry's Morning Dew inspired me to pick up a guitar, and your video helped me a lot playing it, where I thought it would take years. Man, that's awesome. Sometimes I try to try a song lesson and realize I'm just not good enough yet. No, well, that just takes, it literally, it just takes time. It just takes time. And if you work on your chord inversions, the different places that the chords are up and down the neck, it's going to unlock it for you. But again, it takes, it takes time. It just, just, so don't be hard on yourself. Five months, if, if you can play Morning Dew after five months, you're, you're on the right track, man. Like, it took me forever to be able to, like, play a song. And I'm the kind of motherfucker that wanted, I wanted to be able to play guitar and sing at the same time right out of the gate. I was 15, and I was like, I can fucking do this. And it took a lot of, uh, took a lot of time. Um... 
Let's see. Favorite strings. I love to use... Let me see here. Let me see if I've got. So I'm building a guitar, guys, and uh, those videos. Are, I'm I'm in the middle of shooting the the introduction video for, um, for my guitar building video. And I my guitar is measured out to be quite a bit like, like it's a bit longer than like even the wolf here. So like the oh the wolf is a big guitar, but the guitar I'm making is gonna be a little bit bigger because it'll fit my body better. The neck is gonna is is almost gonna uh, the fretboard will probably end here, which means my neck will be a little bit longer in conjunction with the body, and it's gonna be neck through. But that means I had to buy a base case <laughs> for um. So I went and got this this Roadrunner base case, which is gonna be the only thing that fits my my handmade guitar. Uh, but these are the strings I like to use. These Diodario XTs, they're the skinny top heavy bottom, so they're 10 to 52s. The nickel plated steel, extended life, natural feel. I'm not a huge fan of, of strings that have the coating on them. These don't have the coating as far as I know, um, and I love them. They're great. They last forever, even though I change strings every couple weeks because I play so much. Um, Let's see. Da, da, da. I'm self-taught by watching YouTube videos, but people say learn music theory, but never got around to it. Um, I never learned music theory. Like you'll pick it up, because once one stuff starts to make sense to you, you'll be like, "Oh, I get that concept." I may not know how to exactly put it into practice, but I get the whole concept of it because. Through chord inversions and whole, whole, half, you kind of learn everything you need to about theory. Now, you don't, you don't learn, like, the circle of fifths and, like, still, like, if someone's trying to, like, be like, one, four, five, it's like, man, just, just play the song. I can figure it out. Um, I don't like it when people tell me to go to the seven, go to the seven. I'm like, <laughs> but, that's, but that's my ignorance. So, like, if I had gone to school for it, I'm sure I'd feel differently, but I went to the school of hard knocks. Like I was homeless for a long time. So playing me, like I learned how to play playing on the street for people to feed myself. That's how I learned. I learned through necessity, you know? So it's, it's not one of those things where I had the luxury of like sitting down and having the time to really put the work in to learn theory. It's like, no, I had to learn how to play these songs and sing them or otherwise I didn't eat, you know? Uh, so it was through necessity that I, that I learned. Um, Let's see. Easton says, been playing guitar for years and have been making steady progress, but your emphasis on learning chord inversions has exponentially helped me progress with learning songs. Thank Dude, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. That's what we want to do. I want everybody out here playing these songs. I don't care how you get there. I just want you playing this music. It is part of my job here on this planet is to keep this music alive and keep it going. Um, let's see here hey hey martin harris what's going on i'm trying to memorize the whole fretboard when i go to bed i fall asleep counting up the notes instead of sheepo um i mean don't worry about that learn your chord inversions and then you don't really have to worry about all that shit uh singer for dead i don't feel like working anymore <laughs> absolutely maybe just understand the diatonic major minor minor major major minor dim diminished yeah i mean yeah, I think l learning your chord structures work work wonderfully. Um, but guys, that's a that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, if you you know if at any point you'd like to you feel the spirit, you want to tip me for the lessons, you can do that through Venmo or PayPal, or you can do it in the super chat. Um, I appreciate you guys so much. Please hit that like button. That helps everybody else. Um, I, I appreciate this one. Hopefully this one was, I felt pretty good about this one. I feel, I feel pretty good about this lesson because it just want you guys to learn these inversions because that really opens it up. Uh, Ian Quitner, you got it right. Best teacher is your ears. Learn the intervals. That's right. Like really listen to the music, know the songs you're going to play. Like get, get into it, learn these songs and like listen to Jerry play, man. And then you can start to hear, go to Jeff Williams, go to weeping willow, play with their backing tracks. You're going to learn so much by playing with those backing tracks. So, like, try to play the chords along with it and then make a pass where you're trying to play lead with it. But learn the songs. Um, and I love you guys so much. Thank you for everything. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing some, we're going to be doing a fun lesson. Uh, 
but yeah, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go work on, I'm going to go down to the shop and work on my guitar a little bit and take some footage for you guys. So hopefully either the, in, maybe the end of this week, maybe next week, I got a lot of stuff going on this week. I got a show coming up this weekend, so I may not have the first guitar video up this week, but it definitely by next week, you'll have the first, like the introduction video to me building a guitar, let it grow lesson. No, it's going to be a weird Bob lesson. It's going to be a weird Bobby song, but I, you, you probably won't ever guess what it is. Um, but, uh, yeah, love you guys. And I will, uh, I'll see you next time.